Hey y'all, today we'll be doing a Cape Economic Unit 1 Paper 2 for May June 2022. Let's get into it. Module 1 1A Distinguish between a command economy and a free market economy. In a command economy, the government or a central authority exercises significant control over economic activities, including the allocation of resources, production decisions, and the setting of prices. The primary goal is often to achieve social and political objectives, such as income equality and centralized planning, even if it means sacrificing consumer choice and market efficiency. Conversely, a free market economy operates with minimum or minimal government intervention in economic activities. It is characterized by private ownership of resources, goods and services, with market forces of supply and demand determining prices and allocation of resources. Part B with the aid of a diagram explain how prices are adjusted to establish equilibrium in a free market economy for under contraction in supply. So we see here on the y axis we have prices and on the x axis we have the quantity. The graph shows a contraction in supply results in a movement along the supply curve, not a shift. This movement reflects a decrease in the quantity supplied at each price point. As the quantity supply decreases, it results in a shortage, where the quantity demanded exceeds the reduced quantity supplied, that is QD is greater than QS, leading to a higher price and a lower quantity. Encouraging firms to increase their supply until equilibrium is restored or reached at the point where QD is equal to QS. The demand curve remains constant throughout this process. Part C Analyze how knowledge of each of the following can benefit a car manufacturer. We have income elasticity of demand, price elasticity of demand, and cost price elasticity of demand. Firstly, understanding the income elasticity of demand is essential for car manufacturers because it enables them to gauge how changes in consumer income levels impact their products. For instance, a positive YED greater than 1 indicates that cars are a luxury good and as consumers' income rise, the demand for cars will increase proportionally. This information can guide the manufacturer in positioning their vehicles and marketing them to target affluent consumers. On the other hand, if YED is less than one, cars are considered necessities, and the manufacturer can focus on affordability and reliability in their product offerings to cater to a broader market. Secondly, understanding the price elasticity of demand is crucial for a car manufacturer when setting prices. If the PED is elastic, that is, is greater than one, a price decrease will lead to a significant increase in demand. In such a scenario, the manufacturer might consider lowering prices to attract more customers potentially increasing overall revenue. However, if PED is inelastic, that is, it's less than one, a price increase may result in only a modest decrease in demand. This information helps the manufacturer determine their pricing strategies, impact on demand and revenues. Finally, the cross-price elasticity of demand informs the car manufacturer about the relationship between their products and substitute or complementary goods. A positive XED for a substitute good implies that an increase in the price of a competing product will lead to an increase in demand for the manufacturer's cars. This knowledge can aid in, market, in marketing and product differentiation strategies. Conversely, a negative XED for a complementary product suggest that when the price of a complementary could arise, demand for the cars may decrease. Car manufacturers can use this insight to develop partnerships or promotions that encourage the purchase of both cars and complementary products. 
module 2 2 a distinguish between product productive efficiency and allocative efficiency productive efficiency refers to producing goods and services at the lowest possible cost it occurs when an economy or a firm generates the maximum output from a given set of inputs minimizing wastage and inefficiencies in the production process allocative efficiency on the other hand those with distributing resources to maximize overall societal welfare. It occurs when resources match the value consumers place at the last unit of a good. That is the marginal benefit to the cost of producing that unit, the marginal costs. Part B, with the aid of a diagram, explain how market failure is caused by monopoly. On the y-axis, we have the price, revenue, and costs. On the x-axis we have the quantity and we have the average cost or average total cost and we have the marginal cost it always cuts the average total cost at its minimum we have the steeper line right here the marginal revenue and also we have the average revenue which is also equal to the demand curve for a monopolist the first and most notable form of market failure due to monopoly is the significant increase in price that is P sub 1 compared to what would exist in a competitive market P sub M. This price increase leads to a deadweight loss DWL in consumer surplus because it exceeds the marginal cost of production. The area between the demand curve and the price P sub 1 represents this loss, indicating that consumers pay more for the good than they would in a competitive market. Furthermore, monopolies typically produce less output Q sub M than what would occur in a competitive market Q sub 1. This reduced production leads to a misallocation of resources as it is not producing at the socially optimal level. The area between the demand curve and the monopolist output level illustrates the underproduction and the loss of potential economic surplus that a competitive market could have generated. Right here. Part C. Discuss how a government can use each of the following measures to control market failure. Taxation, state ownership, antitrust policy. Taxation, a fundamental fiscal policy instrument, operates to rectify negative externalities, a pervasive source of market dysfunction. By taxing goods and services with associated negative externalities, such as carbon emissions, the government internalizes the external costs, thus optimizing resource allocation. The government can leverage its dual role as a regulator and a revenue generator by channeling the tax revenues into corrective measures or compensatory programs, thereby addressing the online market failures. Secondly, turning to state ownership, this interventionist approach pertains to instances where market failures manifest in the form of unprovided public goods or monopolistic dominance. In response, the government assumes direct control or ownership of essential services or infrastructure. This strategy ensures equitable access and guards against undersupply, a common outcome in private markets. State ownership can also serve as an instrument for dismantling monopolistic structures as government enforced regulations to curb anti competitive behavior and maintain market equilibrium. Finally, antitrust policy on the other hand is an intricate facet of market governance. It is indispensable in situations characterized by monopolies and oligopolies, which undermine the competitive landscape. By implementing antitrust measures, the government fosters competition, a cornerstone of market efficiency. These policies include scrutinizing mergers to prevent excessive market concentration, breaking up dominant firms, and penalizing anti-competitive anti actions. In doing so, 
government curbs the distortions caused by market power, reducing consumer detriment, enhancing economic efficiency, and preserving the dynamism of markets. Module 3, 3A three lists four rewards of the factors of production. Four, the four rewards of the factors of production are rent, wages, interest, and profits. Part B, with the aid of a diagram and assuming that the market is in equilibrium, explain how migration affects the wage rate and employment level in the home low-income country. On the y-axis, we have the wage rate. On the x-axis, we have the quantity of labor. Let's get into it. When individuals migrate from their home country to a high-income country, the workforce in the home country decreases. This shift to the left of the supply curve, S2, represents a reduced labor force due to migration. As a result, the new equilibrium point is at a higher wage rate, W, and a lower employment level, E. This change occurs because with fewer workers, employers in the home country have to compete for the remaining labor force, which drives up wages. However, the decreased labor supply ultimately results in reduced overall employment levels. Part C, evaluate each of the following measures of poverty by defining the measure and outlining how it is used. The evaluation must include one advantage and one disadvantage of each measure. We have the basic needs, the headcount, and the human development index, HDI. Firstly, the basic needs approach assesses poverty by determining whether individuals can meet their essential requirements for survival and well-being, such as access to food, clean water, shelter, and healthcare. It sets a poverty threshold based on the cost of these necessities and classifies those unable to afford them as poor. One significant advantage of this approach is its simplicity and intu intuitiveness. It provides a clear and practical understanding of poverty by focusing on the essentials for a decent standard of living. This approach directs resources to address immediate needs crucial in emergencies and for the most vulnerable. However, a disadvantage is its one-dimensional nature. It may overlook non-monetary aspects of poverty such as access to education, employment opportunities, or social participation, and it may not effectively capture relative deprivation or disparities in income. Secondly, the headcount ratio is a straightforward measure that counts the percentage of a population living below the defined poverty line. It's a binary measure that classifies individuals as poor or non-poor based on income or consumption. The advantage of the headcount measure lies in its simplicity and ease of communication. It provides a clear and easily understandable metric for policymakers and the public to track poverty levels, facilitating the establishment of clear, measurable targets for poverty reduction. On the downside, it provides only a snapshot of poverty at a specific time, neglecting the depth of poverty inequality within the poor population of changes in living standards over time. It relies heavily on income or consumption and does not account for other dimensions of well-being. Lastly, the Human Development Index, HDI, combines income, education, and life expectancy to provide a multidimensional nature of development and poverty. It reflects a broader perspective on well-being by considering not just monetary earnings, but also health and education. The advantage of the HDI is its comprehensive nature. This nature helps policymakers identify areas that require improvement beyond income, promoting long term development and well being. However, a disadvantage is that it aggregates multiple dimensions into a single index, potentially oversimplifying complex issues. Additionally, it assigns equal weights to each dimension, which may not accurately reflect the priorities and the values of different societies and it can mask disparities within countries 
provided a national average. And that is it, guys. See you all next time.